Good morning, everybody. Happy New Year. Welcome. Welcome back to work. I hope everybody got a little bit of uh, rest and uh, peace over the holidays. Uh, we do have a two-way feed from Harborview this morning, so they can actually feed questions uh, back to us. And the important thing about that is that anybody who gets up to ask a question or make a comment has to be on the uh, microphone so uh, they can hear you. Just a couple of general announcements. Uh, we got a note passed along to us from Harborview about uh, a patient that was cared for by Daphne Beingessner. And the patient's comment was, uh, all of the staff at Harborview were highly skilled and courteous. I felt extremely well cared for. My surgeon, Dr. Beingessner, is absolutely incredible with regard to skill and bedside manner and exceeded my expectations in every possible way. And I think we all know uh, that is true about Daphne. Uh, there was a similar comment that was uh, not printed out for me about Dr. Bure and uh, his spectacular uh, care recently of a patient at Harborview. Uh, last announcement is uh, that uh, Adam Sassoon, who is one of our Grand Round speakers today, has just won uh, a fellowship from ACUS, American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons, uh, which is a health policy fellowship uh, that uh, personally I'm pretty excited about. It gets Adam some political experience uh, in Capitol Hill, and he'll be mentored by uh, a senior person uh, with political uh, and health policy experience uh, who's a member of ACUS, so, so that's great. So on to, on to Grand Rounds. Uh, our two speakers this morning are Navin Fernando and Adam Sassoon, and they're talking about post-traumatic reconstruction of the hip. Uh, I uh, had a meeting that I was told was mandatory for me this morning that I actually uh, skipped and got out of because I felt it was so important to be here. These guys, along with some of the other younger people that we've hired the last few years, are the future of our department. Uh, and, and Adam and Navin, I think everybody knows, uh, have been working extremely hard and are two of the bright spots uh, at Northwest Hospital. Uh, they have uh, been taking on uh, seemingly uh, impossible cases and uh, have uh, developed uh, excellent reputations already in the, in the community for uh, being willing to uh, take on these patients. And so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce them this morning. The person who's not here is Jess Teleria, uh, who is uh, in Boston, uh, actually, uh, for two uh, fellowship interviews. But Jess uh, did put together some of the introductory slides, and I was told by these guys uh, she did quite a bit of work uh, putting the talk together, even though she could not be here this morning. Uh, we don't want to set a precedent, so uh, in the future, <laughs> no more absences uh, when you're scheduled to do grand rounds. All right, good morning, everybody. Happy New Year to everybody. I am Navin Fernando. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm one of the total joint surgeons at Northwest Hospital and uh, University of Washington. Uh, today we'll be talking about post-traumatic reconstruction of the hip. I'd also like to thank Jessica for putting together a lot of these slides uh, for us. And I'd like to thank and uh, welcome the Harborview a group who I think are joining us here today remotely and some people are here in the audience today. Uh, certainly you guys are on the front line with dealing with many of these pretty complex problems. Um, and they've been kind enough to involve us in, in their reconstruction in the rare cases that they, they do fail. But hopefully this topic is relevant to many people, given how common these problems are. So in terms of disclosures, none of us, uh, Dr. Sisley and I have no disclosures which are relevant for this talk. <clears throat> so as an introduction, um, I'll review some of the uh, multitude of etiologies which may be responsible for failure fixation about the proximal femur. I'll review some of the basic evaluation which is necessary in order to discern which of these etiologies is most likely responsible for failure after femur fixation. And then uh, uh, more importantly, I'll discuss how these etiologies pertain to whether or not an arthroplasty is indicated, whether or not it's contraindicated, and 
in which circumstances arthroplasty may be a, a viable alternative even to acute internal fixation. And then lastly, I'll talk about some of the basic principles which are common to reconstruction about the hip uh, for any total hip conversion after failed uh, femoral fixation. And Dr. Sassoon and I will talk in a little bit more detail about these specific etiologies and specific failure patterns about the femoral neck, intertrochanteric fractures and acetabular fractures. Hopefully we'll have some time to discuss specific management principles, some current controversies which affect all of these specific uh, problems, and then hopefully provide some evidence-based recommendations after that, leaving some time for discussions and questions at the end. So ultimately the preoperative evaluation begins with asking why did the fixation fail? We know that in total arthroplasty literature, particularly revision literature, understanding the cause of failure is the most important independent predictive failure of whether or not postoperative reconstruction is going to be successful. Obviously, if you don't understand why something failed, it's unlikely you'll be able to provide a reasonable solution which will be successful. We know that there are some common reasons that uh, internal fixation fails. Certainly, the etiologies can broadly be described as biological, mechanical, or septic. We know that significant overlap certainly exists amongst these three etiologies, and it's not uncommon for fixation in the same person that failed for each of these problems individually or cumulatively would be responsible for ultimate, uh, ultimate failure. For biological reasons, we know that there are both patient-dependent and patient-independent factors. For both uh, the trauma literature and arthroplasty literature, this has been extensively studied, and we know there's significant overlap between the pre-existing risk factors, which may predispose somebody to infection. Nutritional factors, certainly in the polytraumatized patient in a catabolic state, may predispose somebody to, to delayed union or non-union. We know in the arthroplasty literature, multiple independent risk factors, obesity, preoperative anemia, uh, low white counts, albumins, et cetera, are independently associated with poor outcomes postoperatively, particularly as they pertain to surgical site infection. You know, smoking, diabetes, anti-inflammatory use in the trauma literature, basic science literature, some clinical work demonstrates an increased likelihood of infection and certainly a non-union. In the arthroplasty literature, we know that this can result in failure both from septic and aseptic loosening. Metabolic reasons are very important. Certainly in the trauma literature, we know this. In the arthroplasty literature, particularly as it pertains to osteoporosis, has significant implications how these patients may be managed. Uh, osteoporosis in of itself is certainly a risk factor for fracture or peripatetic fracture. So often these patients have already demonstrated that their bone is abnormal and uh, the likelihood of obtaining mechanical fixation with press fit components or cementless, uh, cementless fixation is often unreliable. Patient independent factors, obviously for trauma, location of fracture, present of comminution, soft tissue stripping are all important factors and are independently associated with the likelihood of non-union. In the arthroplasty literature, this is equally important uh, as the viability of the blood supply to the bone, particularly the endosteal blood supply, is critically important in order to reliably achieve uh, osteointegration or definitive mechanical fixation. So many of these patients who may undergo an open fracture also may not be suitable con candidates for a cementless fixation. You may look to alternatives such as cemented fixation in order to provide them with relief. So the preoperative evaluation, osteonecrosis, particularly as it pertains to the femoral head, we know is independently associated or reliable on the integrity of the deep branch of the medial femoral circumflex artery. We know that this is highly reliant on the location of the fracture, certainly subcapital fractures, depending on the degree of displacement of a much higher likelihood of osteonecrosis in comparison to intertrochanteric fractures. The degree of comminution is an independent risk factor for failure after, inter, after internal fixation, particularly post-remedial comminution as it pertains to the proximity of the deep branch of the MFCA, as well as the likelihood of being able to achieve rigid internal fixation in the context of these difficult fractures. We know the uh, fracture reduction or the accuracy of the fracture reduction is very important, um, particularly as it pertains to malrotation or varus malunion uh, is independently associated with failure of these fractures, and then timing, which is more controversial in terms of whether or not acute versus late fixation ultimately changes the natural history of osteonecrosis in these patients. So why is this important in terms of how it pertains to arthroplasty? It's important because osteonecrosis should be explainable. I think regardless of the type of fracture, osteonecrosis should have one of these pre 
existing risk factors in order to explain it. We know that osteomyelitis may in itself cause a environment where osteonecrosis is possible. It can result in intraosseous pressures, which can compress the microcirculation of the femoral head and cause osteonecrosis. We know that <coughs> total hip arthroplasty for osteonecrosis has a higher incidence of parapacetic fracture in comparison to total hip arthroplasty for primary degenerative arthritis. So that may be explained by multiple factors, but certainly one of those may be an insidious osteomyelitis or even septic arthritis, which is not detected, not detected in the preoperative state. So a high degree of suspicion should be had for these patients. Femoral head collapse can be typically well identified using typical diagnostic modalities, x-ray, certainly at least from delineating collapse from pre-collapse. MRI and bone scan are better tests, uh, although the reliability of these tests may be potentially compromised by the presence of internal hardware. Ultimately, the treatment algorithm for these patients is very similar. Uh, ultimately, collapse versus non-collapse is the most important um, factor, which helps decide what treatment is most appropriate. Young versus elderly patients becomes a little bit more nuanced, particularly when it becomes um, physiologically, physiological age versus expectations for many of these patients. Non-union, we know that non-union is a more rare problem, but is typically much more symptomatic than osteonecrosis. Osteonecrosis is actually relatively common if scrutinized, but may be asymptomatic. Uh, non-union, depending on the cause of non-union, is important. Certainly if the non-union occurs because of mechanical fixation, but the biological environment is normal, then revision internal fixation with an attempt of compression plating or bone grafting is a very reasonable alternative. Some circumstances, I think at least, where arthroplasty would be a viable alternative for these patients are cases where the cause is clearly atrophic non-union or failure of biological environment. These patients are, in many cases, unlikely to be successful with a revision internal fixation, and the more reliable procedure may be a revision arthroplasty. The age of the patient, to some degree, is important. Perhaps more important than age is expectations for these people. Certainly after arthroplasty, there are lifelong restrictions and limitations on what patients can do. So for a young patient who has certain expectations and needs, it would certainly be reasonable and highly defensible to consider revision internal fixation for these patients. The location of the fracture, the location of the non-union is also of some importance. Certainly the non-union as it relates to the proximity of the femoral head. The more proximal the non-union is, to some degree, the more likely that these patients will undergo a uncomplicated total of arthroplasty because of the proximal apophysis, because the anatomy and integrity of the greater trochanter is normal. These patients often do reasonably well, and removal of internal fixation is typically unchallenging. So what about exclusive mechanical failure? For these patients, I think there's somewhat less controversy. Um, it does depend to some degree on age. Certainly for, for younger patients, an attempt at internal fixation, purely due to mechanical failure because of a poor implant or implant placement, deserve a chance at a revision and internal fixation. There are some nuances, however, certainly femoral head viability and potentially even pre-existing degenerative arthritis are factors which are important in determining whether or not an arthroplasty versus a revision to internal fixation is the most uh, reasonable option. Certainly we know that arthroplasty, although it may not be ideal in a young patient, is relatively reliable. Um, so an attempted internal fixation has to have, I think, a high degree or a likelihood of success. Um, certainly as least as high, if not higher, uh, than arthroplasty in order to uh, sell it in some degrees to a patient. Um, ultimately, although this is never the consideration, I'm sure, for a trauma surgeon, it's ideal not to compromise potential for a salvage total of arthroplasty. A well done internal fixation or internal revision uh, typically does not, but these may be considerations that a trauma surgeon has uh, when planning for a patient's future. So infection, which is the bane of the existence certainly of the uh, total of arthroplasty surgery, we know that in the coming decades, this will certainly be the most important risk factor and the most common cause for failure of total arthroplasty. There are multiple factors common, again, to both trauma and arthroplasty, which are risk factors for failure and uh, for parapacetic joint infection for these patients. Open injury, wound problems, repeat INDs, 
uh, independent risk factors in arthroplasty, in obesity, prior infection, immunosuppression, bacteremia, skin disorders, IV drug use, all of these are considered high risk preoperative risk factors. Radiological risk factors include early implant loosening and osteolysis. This has been described by the uh, Academy's clinical practice guidelines. This specifically pertains to early loosening of an implant, so a total hip or a total knee arthroplasty. At the same time, I feel at least that early implant loosening of internal fixation, a DHS or a sliding hip screw, uh, ultimately if there isn't an obvious reason for failure, which can be explained mechanically, that uh, infection should be considered and really considered present until ruled out definitively. So I think a high degree of suspicion should be had for all of these patients, and I certainly approach most of these patients with that degree of scrutiny. So ultimately, this, this is a busy slide, but it describes what the Academy uh, recommends in terms of approaching patients with a high degree or moderate degree of suspicion preoperatively for, for infection. Uh, ultimately, like I said, I, I approach all these patients with a high degree of suspicion, so everyone screened for infection with an ESR and CRP. If the likelihood I feel is low, then ESR and CRP are adequate screening tools. Negative is unlikely for infection, but never zero. There's certainly a, a context for frozen sections if there's any interoperative suspicion. Anyone who has a high degree of suspicion for infection gets a accumulation of ESR and CRP as well as an aspirate. The aspiration allows you to ana analyze the synovial count, the differential, as well as culture. So that provides five metrics in combination with the ESR and CRP. Three of those five, if positive, are suspicious or suggestive of infection. And this has been adopted by the Musculoskeletal Infection Society as well. Obviously, in arthroplasty, some degree have the luxury of time. We can work these patients up and, and optimize them. In the context of acute failed hardware, we don't often have that, that luxury, as you can imagine. So certainly, again, there may be a role for interoperative frozen sections as well as stat interoperative synovial fluid analysis to help guide decision making. So general principles of arthroplasty, we know that uh, previous incisions when uh, available should be used. Ultimately, the vasculature about the hip is different than that about the knee or the ankle, so new incisions if necessary certainly can be made with less of a risk of skin necrosis. Any incision that is utilized should be extensile enough that it can both remove hardware through the same incision and provide adequate exposure to allow for a robust reconstruction. If infection is definitively identified and arthroplasty is planned, although there isn't the abundance of literature on this, my, my recommendation, I think most arthroplasty surgeons would prefer a two-stage protocol with debridement of all infected or necrotic bone, implantation of an antibiotic impregnated spacer, whether they be mobile or static, intravenous antibiotics, monitoring of patients for both clinical improvement as well as inflammatory markers, an antibiotic window, re-aspiration, and then definitive re-implantation should there be no evidence of residual infection. Leg length discrepancy is, in some cases, significant. Given the extent of modularity that exists today with total arthroplasty, most of these discrepancies can be overcome. Significant discrepancies may need, or may need multiple procedures for individual lengthening. Malunion can be a problem, certainly as it pertains to intertrochanteric fractures, um, and specifically as it pertains to the position of the greater trochanter. The trochanter, in many cases, or some cases, may overlap the canal. Trochanter may be malpositioned, resulting in a decrease in tension, which may compromise the stability of a total arthroplasty. In some cases, a trochanteric slide osteotomy is necessary in order to one, access the canal, and two, to retention the abductor to allow for adequate stability. Malunion of the metaphysis from the diaphysis is a very complicated problem. In some circumstances, may require staged osteotomies, simultaneous osteotomies, and certainly the availability of modular stems, which allow for independent diaphyseal and metaphyseal fixation, are important in these circumstances. Maximization of fixation is important for all of these cases, I think, regardless of the location of the uh, fixation failure. Secondary to oste disused osteopenia, or even subtle changes in anatomy, typically preclude, preclude these patients from having successful fixation at the metaphyseal alone. So typically, some degree of diaphyseal fixation is necessary, or even cemented fixation if, again, the biological environment has been compromised. Stress risers should be avoided by at least two cortical diameters, as we know. And stability should be optimized, certainly with a greater degree of certainty, even than primary total arthroplasty. We know that 
uh, amongst this population, dislocation is extremely common for a multitude of reasons. So uh, maximization of stability through the variety of techniques and strategies we have should be achieved and should be confirmed on the operating room table prior to leaving. So specifically looking at failed femoral neck fractures, uh, in the young person we know that typically these fractures fail secondary to mechanical reasons. Um, we know this partly because revision of these patients with internal fixation typically re re which is, results in you know, reasonable outcomes. The, the goal for most of these patients should be preservation of the native hip joint. A lot of this literature is based on poor success with total arthroplasty uh, historically in patients who are less than 30. Uh, a lot of that literature may be flawed because cemented fixation was used and there were very high rates of aseptic loosening reported up to 70% even at 10 years. Um, and conventional bearing surfaces were used certainly in the early 80s when a lot of this literature became uh, prevalent. So has anything changed really in the last 15 to 20 years? There have been some systematic reviews that have analyzed this. Uh, Closey's group looked at uh, systematic review assessing total arthroplasty in patients less than 30 uh, who had arthroplasty before 1988 and after 1998 when cement less fixation became more prevalent. Although they found that the rate of radio radiological loosening was significantly less, patients were still uh, clinically less than satisfied uh, and hip related uh, quality of life metrics were very low. Uh, similarly, the group from Cleveland Clinic looked at activity levels and functional outcomes in young patients undergoing toilet arthroplasty. Again, the rate of loosening has approached zero, which is very similar, you know, a 10-year outcome, or 10-year follow-up, I should say, in comparison to a toilet arthroplasty for primary degenerative arthritis. But again, patients are typically unsatisfied, young patients in particular. So I still think that in the absence of um, significant improvements in toilet arthroplasty, preservation of the native hip joint should still be the standard of care. We know that standard of care, historically at least, has been analogous producing osteotomy about the hip. Uh, as we know, the concept behind this is converting shear forces into compressive forces by changing a vertical fracture pattern into a horizontal fracture pattern. Uh, one of the advantages of this procedure may be the ability to increase leg length in shortened extremities. The disadvantages, certainly, from an arthroplasty perspective, may include medialization of the diaphysis. Uh, inadvertently, which can complicate uh, the ability to apply a straight stem, as well as inadvertent shortening of the trochanter, which can uh, inadvertently affect the abductor moment arm and, and potentially result in limbs and or instability. As I mentioned, the outcomes for failed femoral neck fractures uh, through an intratrochanteric osteotomy are often high. Successful union has been reported anywhere between 70 and 86 percent in the literature, and cessation of head collapse has reported as very high, between 83 and 86 percent. In the elderly patient, I think there's somewhat less controversy, particularly in terms of the goals that we're trying to achieve. Pain relief, early mobilization, minimization of complications, and ideally offering these patients a final arthroplasty or final option, whether that be internal fixation or arthroplasty, that will last the rest of their lives. So ultimately, if there is controversy, the question probably is, should we be fixing these in the first place? I think with uh, recent literature, including some prospective randomized controlled trials, that question is, is certainly up for debate. Uh, total of arthroplasty in this study out of Sweden demonstrated a 17-year follow-up, improved clinical outcomes as well as improved, improved functional outcomes for the total of arthroplasty group in comparison to the internal fixation group. More importantly, potentially, in the internal fixation group, again, a 17-year follow-up, 39% of these patients in the internal fixation group required a major reoperation, uh, as opposed to 9% in the total of arthroplasty group. And most of these reoperations were conversions to total of arthroplasties, and most of those happening within a short time period. So the question could be, why not try to fix them, and then if they fail, uh, convert them to a total of arthroplasty? The question was asked um, by this group out of the UK. They did a retrospective ma matched case cohort series looking at patients who either underwent total arthroplasty for acute femoral neck fractures, which are displaced, or underwent a salvage arthroplasty for failed internal fixation, 107 patients in each group. Ultimately, they found that in the group which was salvaged, there was a significantly increased rate of both 
superficial and deep surgical site infections, 12 as opposed to 3. And more worrisome, there are 21 dislocations in the salvage group in comparison to 9 in the acute total of arthroplasty group. Uh, decreased functional outcomes were also seen as well as implant survivorship. So the reasons for this might, might be multifactorial, certainly, but ultimately, when matching these groups as, as well as they could, the salvage arthroplasty group potentially may have compromised the successful acute internal, uh, acute total of arthroplasty for these patients. We know that there are two major options, hemiarthroplasty versus total of arthroplasty. The technical considerations are relatively similar for both of these patients' groups. Uh, surgical approach, I think, is surgeon's choice. Uh, again, hardware removal should be easier and should be accessible through whatever surgical decision is chosen. It's important to dislocate prior to hardware removal in order to avoid the likelihood of fracture or propagation through uh, screw sites. Osteoporosis is 100% essentially in all of these patients, so broaching should be extremely careful. Reaming of total arthroplasty is considered should be very careful. Currently, likely the standard of care for these patients, at least on the femoral side, is the cemented arthroplasty. Uh, on the acetabular side, Pressfit is a reasonable option, knowing that a high rate of parapsychic fractures have been reported in some patients, particularly with elliptical cups, and when placing a cup which is larger than two millimeters, that is prepared for. Larger femoral heads certainly should be considered. We know that instability is very high in these patients, even if it com comes at a compromise to the thickness of the polyethylene. The advantages of hemiarthroplasty certainly may include shorter operative time. Less blood loss has been historically reported in literature, although this paradigm may be changing now with the increased use of transexamic acid. In the total of arthroplasty literature, in several recent studies, the incidence of transfusion is approaching 0% after, uh, after the use of transexamic acid, so this may become less of a relevant issue. The advantage may be increased in stability, given the large, set, large head sizes which are available given that the acetabular component does not need to be considered. The major indications, I think, at this point really are cognitive or neuromuscular disorders, which may preclude the use of hip precautions or may predispose a patient to instability due to muscular imbalances. Surgeon familiarity certainly is a consideration. Total arthroplasty in this patient population group is not as straightforward as primary degenerative arthritis, and certainly if a surgeon is prepared to perform this operation, they have to be prepared to deal with any of the complications which may occur intraoperatively or postoperatively. The advantages of total arthroplasty at this point, I think, are quite clear. Most studies in the literature that have looked at this demonstrate consistently improved pain and improved functional outcomes in comparison to hemiarthroplasty, and in some cases, in compared to internal fixation. Increased implant longevity may be an important factor, particularly for younger patients and then subsequently decreased revision rates in comparison to hemiarthroplasties, and particularly bipolars, which have a poor quality polyethylene and may have a high rate of femoral loosening. The historical indications for this problem were acetabular sided arthritis with pre-existing hip pain. Uh, again, this paradigm may be changing given the uh, recent literature, the predominance of literature that's been published. Community ambulators certainly, again, historically have been uh, considered more likely for this patient. Low demand patients uh, still certainly may best benefit from a hemiarthroplasty. The literature, what does it show? This is a recent meta analysis by Mo Bandari's group looking at eight systematic, eight randomized controlled trials, including uh, approximately 1,000 patients. Essentially, all metrics that they measured hair SIP scores, uh, the pain score of the WOMAC, the overall WOMAC score, as well as hip, hip related quality of life scores, all demonstrated statistically significant improvements with total arthroplasty in comparison to hemiarthroplasty. The one major disadvantage, again, continued to be dislocation in this group, although this trial also included patients that have smaller femoral head sizes and potentially even before robust posterior capsule repairs were, were known to be important. The dislocation rate in more recent studies has shown to be more equitable, and with the popularization of tripolar constructs or dual mobility type constructs, the uh, rate of instability is, is very, very low, even in this high risk population. All right. Uh, I just want to echo my uh, colleague's sentiment at the beginning of this uh, talk. Thanks for coming out. It's really a pleasure to be able to speak with you.
this morning about this topic, which is near and dear to my heart, involving both trauma and arthroplasty. Um, but moving forward, you know, we've sort of uh, talked about how these cases are a little bit complicated. It's not the classic, you know, paint by number arthroplasty cases that we often get uh, teased about, you know, every knee being the same and every hip being the same. Um, you know, and we, when we look at the literature, you know, one of the big questions is, are these uh, conversion cases being done by uh, trauma surgeons? Or are they being done by arthroplasty surgeons? Who are they being done by? You know, why do people think uh, it's so hard? But I would say, you know, don't just take our word for it. Here's a group, uh, Rothman, that does a lot of arthroplasty. And they looked at uh, their own series in expert hands converting failed femoral neck uh, fixation and intertroch uh, fixation to total hips. And they had a 10, close to 10% complication rate, which is much higher than their quoted uh, elective complication rate, obviously, and a 7% reoperation rate, which is also very high for their group. Um, they noted uh, also in this, uh, in this group comparing the femoral necks to the intertroch fracture uh, revisions that uh, intertroch uh, conversions were much more difficult. So that kind of segues into the next topic here. Um, where we're, where we're going to be looking at uh, total hip arthroplasty in the setting of intertroch fractures. But if you look, this is a table from their, um, from their paper. And dislocation rates range anywhere between 0 and 22 percent in, in these conversion uh, procedures. And uh, the reoperation rate also is anywhere between, you know, um, 8 and 18 percent. So let's look at total hip arthroplasty in the setting of intertroch fractures. So, we, we commonly see it indicated in failed fixation of intertroch fractures in the elderly. It's less commonly performed acutely uh, for uh, intertroch fractures. Let's look at a case here. This is a case that I did during my fellowship. Uh, this is a 61-year-old female that presents after a mechanical ground level fall. She has a history of uh, alcohol, significant alcohol use and hip pain, and she presents with these x-rays. So. I'm going to ask one of the residents maybe to sort of uh, tell me what they think here, uh, Dr. Hug. Yeah, what else do you notice about her hip? Yeah, and what about our femoral head? Right, I think those are all good points. So she kind of has, I would say this is probably sort of a reverse obliquity type intertroch fracture, some subtroch anteric extension. She has uh, obvious cystic changes on both sides of her hip joint. But uh, the surgeon on call went ahead and decided to fix this with a um, cephalomedullary nail. And technically, they did a good job with the bone stock they had available. And you can kind of guess where this is going to go. The fracture ended up healing. The problem is, is the head really didn't support the, the metallic implant. It cut right through at, uh, a couple months after uh, she was fixed. Um, so now, now we have to uh, help this lady who is no longer able to put weight through her uh, right lower extremity. So when we're thinking of how to plan for these cases, you know, we have to kind of bring a bigger toolbox. It's not the standard total hip. So there's a few things to address. So maybe uh, I'd ask uh, Dr. Warner what she thinks in terms of options for stems, sockets, and maybe any adjunctive procedures at the time of hip arthroplasty the patient may need. And then what about stem fixation options? Would you, would you use like a metaphyseal engaging stem, diaphyseal engaging stem? Yeah, I think uh, those are all good points. You know, obviously the metaphysis here has been violated by the cephalomedullary <laughs> screws. So you're not going to have a reliable fixation there. Also, given her history of AVN, I think her bone quality in general is going to be poor. And then I think you want to have uh, augments available is not a bad idea, but certainly some bone graft available too. 
to uh, help with some of the cystic changes you see on the acetabular side of the joint. And then um, one thing that we're going to touch on a little bit more later is stability in these patients. So after a cephalomedullary nail is placed, it's commonly uh, the abductor insertion on the trochanter is reamed away, and these patients have a compromise of their hip stability. So you want to have other options such as a dual mobility type construct or even a constrained liner sometimes to help uh, with your stability. She has a little bit of troke overhang here uh, based on the way her fracture is healed. So, you know, in those patients, it's good to have a burr available too to kind of make sure that you can get through some of the sclerotic bone with your brooch and, and uh, access the intramedullary canal. So, she underwent um, a diapsial engaging uh, stem placement uh, and a dual mobility type construct with bone grafting of her acetabular defects. And uh, she did very well. These are her three month uh, follow up x rays. But you know, how, do, how do these patients do in general? Um, this is a, a very classic article here from the Mayo Clinic. Uh, Heide Kiewicz and Barry uh, looked at 60 patients done uh, between 85 and 97 with a mean fall of five years. Uh, 44 patients who were available for analysis, 40 were able to ambulate, they had two revisions, they only had one patient who had two dislocations. Now, I think a lot of the, uh, the low complication right here is uh, due to uh, high incidence of cemented stem fixation, so this decreases your risk of intraoperative fracture substantially in these patients, but uh, overall encouraging results. Um, so that, that one was, the first one that I showed is kind of easy because the troke's already healed. So Bigger problems uh, arise when you have a troke fracture that hasn't healed already. So this is a 83-year-old gentleman that presents two weeks after his intertroke fracture was fixed and he, and he sustained a, a ground level fall. He also happens to enjoy drinking alcoholic beverages. And uh, th these were his presenting films. He underwent fixation with a, um, a helical blade type uh, cephalomedullary device. And after his ground level fall, he, he uh, ends up with this. So. Uh, maybe I ask uh, Dr. Gundel to, to, to tell me what he thinks about the uh, x-ray and what he would want to do and have available for this case. Yeah, so I think, you know, options here include, uh, I, would, I would probably take revision fixation off the table for this gentleman just because he's 83 and uh, his bone looks really horrible. Um, additionally, in terms of uh, the arthroplasty options, I think you're right, diabetes stem is important. You want to bypass the uh, distal interlocking screw there to prevent a stress riser. I think that's important. And then your options really are, you know, either a proximal femoral replacement for this gentleman depending on the soft tissue attachment left on the trochanter um, and uh, a, a revision uh, with, a, with a, you know, either a modular or diaphyseal engaging stem and, a, you know, cabling that trochanteric segment to your construct. So um, what we ended up doing was preparing the distal uh, aspect of the femur with a diaphyseal engaging stem. You can see we have a cerclage cable around that which we placed prophylactically before we start reading to prevent propagation of the fracture. I think that's a very important technical pearl. You want to remember to do that so that you don't end up with a long spiral diabetes fracture when you're preparing these uh, osteoporotic patients. And then what we were able to do is once we had the stem down, cable the, um, the trochanteric fragment back to the patient uh, and the construct that we had distally. And so uh, the, these are his uh, final x-rays. and. Unfortunately, this patient uh, actually developed a periprosthetic infection. I think he had a lot of risk factors for that, including poor protoplasm, two operations within a two-week period of time, and so he ended up getting explanted and has a spacer in now. But um, 
It's important when you think about intertrochanteric fractures to remember the spectrum of stability. And you know, this is an important slide, I think, not just for trauma surgeons, but also for arthroplasty surgeons that take trauma call, um, or anyone really that takes trauma call. We like to think, you know, inter intramedullary nails can take care of most problems, almost all problems when, as it relates to um, intertrochanteric fractures. But I think the Sliding hip screws are also very good devices to use in more stable fracture patterns. And, you know, so um, in the absence of some of these uh, radiographic findings that may indicate a more unstable fracture pattern, we want to think about using DHSs or sliding hip screws um, because there's been data to support that revision of a sliding hip screw has a much lower complication rate when compared to revision of an intramedullary nail. So this study, which was a multi-center study, showed a 42% complication rate when uh, intramedullary nails were revised compared to a 12% complication rate when DHSs were used. And I think a lot of that, based on what the authors are talking about, has, is a result of damage to your trochanter, damage to your um, abductor insertion, resulted instability. Um, you know, I think there's some selection bias, obviously, in this study because the fractures that we're using intramedullary nails on are inherently more comminuted and more unstable, and potentially the bone is worse. But it's really important to think about um, if you if you have an intertroch fracture that would be amenable to DHS fixation, I think it's it's something that you should uh, favor. So we talked about sort of the conversion of a healed intertroch fracture. We've talked about more acute in the setting of a non-union um, or a periprosthetic fracture around a nail. What about acutely? When is it indicated that patients should undergo acute total hip arthroplasty in the setting of intertroch fractures? Some people think never. Some people think if there's pre-existing osteoarthritis or AVN, history of radiation, anything that would compromise fracture union. Um, also some inflammatory arthritis um, patients may benefit from uh, acute total hip arthroplasty. So here's a study that looked at uh, IT fractures treated in rheumatoid arthritis patients, and they had a failure of fixation in this series of close to, you know, one-fourth of patients had failure. Um, now, I think that uh, it's unfair to say that all these patients would have benefited from, benefited from arthroplasty because some of these failures were, were a result of infection, which obviously wouldn't, wouldn't be any better for a hip replacement. But Certainly, um, uh, there, there is a component here to think about uh, in patients that have inflammatory arthritis uh, that present with uh, intertroch fractures. You may want to consider um, acute arthroplasty. Here's another uh, study out of Belgium. They looked at uh, 37 patients treated with endoprosthetic replacement. They compared this to 42 patients treated with a fixed angle plate, and they found that uh, replacement was associated with better rehab, decreased pulmonary complications, decreased bed sores, and good functional outcomes. And again, this is not compared to more conventional means of fixation, such as IM nails. This was, however, studied. This is an article uh, from, I believe, 2004 in JVJS, and they looked at uh, intramedullary uh, nail fixation versus uh, uncemented calcar replacing hemiarthroplasty, and they found no difference in um, Harris hip scores or functional results, but they did find increased operative time, increased blood loss, increased cost, and uh, increased three-year mortality in the replacement group. So I certainly don't think we should be giving up internal fixation for these patients, um, especially uh, with modern uh, forms of fixation, uh, which uh, I think outperform the majority of patients that present with these fractures. So what about... Uh, Extenuating circumstances. So this is a case I did towards the end of my fellowship. This is an 86-year-old male that presented with an intertrochanteric fracture. Uh, he had uh, significant pre-existing arthritis in nearly, like, essentially an autofused hip. He had had a previous skiffy, which was fixed with some Knowles pins that you can see were buried. Um, and this is a gentleman, I think, that um, meets criteria for acute arthroplasty in the setting of intertroch fracture. For a number of reasons. One, he had a pain, particularly painful hip to start. Two, it's very hard to move the proximal segment when you have an autofused hip, so it makes reduction of this fracture particularly challenging. And then even with hardware in place, the, the most likely spot that, that, the, that the leg is going to move is through the fracture site and not through his, his fused hip joint. So 
This is one that um, was particularly challenging and required uh, a, a pretty big toolbox and some um, uh, sort of advanced arthroplasty uh, surgical techniques, including an insight to neck cut, um, placement of a modular stem, and then obviously the fixation of the intertroph fracture. I'm not going to belabor that. Um, but these are just a summary of key technical pearls um, that uh, I think are shared when dealing with uh, femoral neck fix failed femoral neck fixation and intertroph fixation. Um, you want to have uh, many stem options available uh, for um, the acetabular side of things. You want to have different levels of constraint, especially if you're revising the intramedullary nail given their uh, high rate of reported uh, dislocation following conversion procedures. Uh, you want to make sure you have bone graft available um, and um, uh, avoid some of the other um, risk factors for, for intraoperative fractures such as broaching through sclerotic bone. Um, so I would just submit that for your review and that's online. Um, we're going to move on to, the, to our final topic which is total hip arthroplasty in the setting of acetabular fractures. So when is total hip arthroplasty a player for these patients? So obviously failure of fixation and then I think also it's worth consideration in acetabular fracture types that have not historically demonstrated much success either acutely or subacutely after a period of benign neglect. And then certainly if you have combined acetabular and femoral head or neck fractures, these patients don't tend to do well uh, or pre-existing osteoarthritis or inflammatory arthritis. So I'm going to touch on this briefly. Goals of acetabular fixation obviously are to restore anatomic joint surfaces, maintain the femoral head reduced underneath the acetabular dome, restore uh, hip uh, uh, biomechanics. When these cannot be reliably achieved, I think arthroplasty should enter the conversation. So Acetabular fracture fixation, as you guys well know from your time at Harview, it's a, it's a high stakes game. So you get within two millimeters, patients tend to do pretty well. They have a 13% chance of um, post-traumatic arthritis. If you're greater than two millimeters, that essentially triples that risk. So um, it's big time football. And then there's certain uh, fracture patterns, obviously, that are um, bad players. This is uh, from Anglin's article looking at uh, impaction of the uh, uh, dome and the medial wall, uh, wall of the acetabulum which was uh, a predictor of a failure in 100% of patients in his series. So this is a, a paper by uh, uh, Herskovici out of Tampa and he looked at combined fixation and uh, total hip arthroplasty in some of these patients that have uh, the bad uh, fracture patterns uh, that, would, that uh, historically have done poorly with uh, standard fixation techniques. And he looked at 22 patients uh, with an average fall of close to three years. And uh, following this surgeries, uh, the, this combined uh, fixation uh, and arthroplasty, the, the patients achieved a Harris-Hip score of about 76. Notably, six patients did have post-operative dislocations and five required revision or osteolysis or instability. So here's a case that I did with Dr. Heidekiewicz during my trauma fellowship in a patient that had um, medial wall, essentially a bicolumnar fracture with medial wall uh, uh, impaction. Um, and you can see there on the uh, CT, he had also had a goal sign there on the coronal uh, slice. You can see 3D renderings there. Essentially what we did was play this posterior column to give, a, give us a buttress to work with and then place the total of arthroplasty and that patient did pretty well. What about subacutely? This is a, a paper by uh, our very own Dr. Bella Barba and uh, he looked at uh, 30 patients that had total hip arthroplasty performed uh, on an average of 37 months following an acetabular fracture. Half of the patients that he looked at uh, had undergone fixation, half had undergone uh, conservative management, and uh, they compared these patients to 204 controls treated for non-traumatic osteoarthritis, um, and the survivorship and the Harris hip scores were comparable to this group, essentially statistically indifferent. Um, and uh, notably, 
what I find interesting is that in this group that's converted, they had no dislocations or infections. Begs the question, maybe we should try and fix everything if they do better when we convert them. So uh, that may be something worth, worth combining our efforts uh, in Northwest and Harborview and maybe looking at a study to do that. Um, here's a couple cases that I've had the opportunity to be involved in since coming to Seattle. Um, this is a patient uh, who sustained a significant injury while skiing. He had bilateral injuries. He had a femoral neck fracture on the left, which went on to non-unite and required a pulse osteotomy, you can see there. And then he had an acetabular fracture, a subtroch fracture, and distally uh, a shaft fracture, his femur. So unfortunately, despite excellent fixation and anatomic reduction of his acetabular fracture, he developed AVN of the femur. And uh, this was revised. Uh, actually, all the hardware in this case was, was left in place. We were able to ream up to the lag screw and had good coverage of our acetabular component. Uh, his nail was removed and we placed the diaphyseal engaging stem, bypassing his previous um, subtrochanteric fracture. Um, we did lengthen him a little on this side as he was short preoperatively due, I think, to some shortening of the leg through his femoral shaft fracture as well as lengthening of the contralateral side through the Paul's osteotomy. So he's very uh, pleased with the, the, the length we were able to get him. Here's another case I, I was involved in yesterday with Dr. Clavino. This is a patient that was uh, treated for a bad uh, posterior column, posterior wall, acetabular fracture. You can see postoperatively uh, excellent uh, reduction was achieved. Despite this, the patient uh, underwent a mechanical failure with subsequent dislocation of his hip. And uh, we had the opportunity to tag team this yesterday. And you can see the hip center was um, medialized and also moved proximally secondary to some of the bone loss um, that occurred uh, due to his, his non-union. But um, despite that, we were able to uh, get away with only needing to remove a couple screws and get a nice hip in for him. So the things that you want to have available for these cases obviously are metal cutting burrs. You want to make sure you have bone graft available. Um, this patient required a dual mobility construct given his history of uh, chronic dislocation. You want to make sure you have options including constrained liners, dual mobility um, uh, bearing surfaces and other things to maximize your hip stability. Um, so these are challenging cases. They're fun cases. Um, and uh, certainly it's been a pleasure uh, starting here and having uh, uh, our colleagues at Harborview to work with. And, um, and thanks for the opportunity to, to give this lecture this morning. I hope you found it educational uh, and um, thought provoking. So thanks a lot. And then I guess we'll get open up to, to, to questions and answers. Yeah, thank you, uh, Adam and Navin, uh, for the nice talk. And I echo your comments. Uh, those can be brutally difficult cases to do. I had a question for Navin. Uh, you came from the Rothman Institute, which is uh, one of the homes of the direct anterior approach. And I, and I know that's something that you commonly perform. Yet, uh, when you talked about approaching uh, the uh, femoral-sided fractures, uh, you did not mention the direct anterior approach as one of the options, and I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, so, I mean, historically, the direct anterior approach has been described as, you know, stencil, as you know. I think some um, surgeons that are very familiar with the direct anterior approach are using it more commonly now for revision. I think on the femoral side, it's actually not entirely challenging to do femoral revisions. It's quasi-extensile. You can extend it distally. You can elevate the vastus, develop a, a quasi-interval between the ITB and the medius. But I think for acetabular revisions, even though it's described, I think it's very challenging. And it's going to take a while before I, I tackle any acetabular revisions with an anterior approach, particularly for posterior column defects. I really can't conceptualize how you can you know, address acetabular deficiency, particularly with uh, with an anterior probe. So I just don't think for these types of, of, of injuries, which are challenging enough, we want to create a, a situation where it becomes more challenging for, for what gain. I'm not sure. So so if you get a uh, 
you know, intercapsular fracture that's been fixed with screws uh, that's failed. Are you, what approach are you using? So, I mean, that's a good question. So, I've done, for, for acute femoral neck fractures, I've done a couple direct anterior toe lips for that injury. Um, I mean, I think if the deformity is isolated to the proximal aspect of the femur, I mean, I think that's the window they see. In some cases, it's actually easier. You know, for, I think for femoral neck fractures, the exposure is looking straight down on the femoral head. It's very easy to remove the femoral head. Exposure is relatively easy. So those, I think those fractures are amenable to uh, fixation and, and maybe conversion through a direct interior. But anything else, you don't want to compromise yourself. So I might, when I get more familiar with the approach, I guess, consider it. But I, for me, uh, I think uh, I, I don't like the anterior approach for those fractures. It's tempting to think, uh, boy, you know, it, de it improves your stability so much. You're not going through the posterior capsule, the short external rotators. But the problem is, in, in, for me, in my hands, I feel like these patients that have acute femoral neck fractures have already failed the litmus test in terms of bone quality. And I don't, uh, I don't press fit stems in patients that I do totals on. Um, for acute femoral neck fractures, I cement and use hybrid fixation for all my uh, total hip arthroplasties in the setting of femoral neck fractures. So it's hard to cement, I think, a, a stem um, in the anterior approach. It's not, it's not uh, impossible, but I think the visualization is not as good. Uh, additionally, I worry about preparation of the femur in patients that have already had a fracture. Um, and certainly dealing with an uh, interoperative fracture through an anterior approach is a problem. So I think, you know, a lot of the data that shows higher dislocation rates uh, in the setting of acute fractures is, is old. I think we have bigger heads now that we use. We do a posterior capsular repair. I think a posterior approach is a workhorse for me, and I have had good results with it. Um, and then in terms of revising a, um, fixation through an anterior approach, I also think it's problematic because generally I don't rely on the tap seal fixation. Um, you know, even if they've just had screws, I tend to use either, uh, um, you know, diapseal, usually diapseal fixation for those patients or cemented stem. So again, uh, I just, I don't feel, I, I feel like that's really for the 60-year-old uh, kayaker that's uh, trying to get back out on Lake Union, you know. I have a question, I guess, for both of you. Um, unlike the displaced femoral neck and the elderly, where we have pretty good success rates with arthroplasty, whether it's hemi or total, we can uh, yeah, sure. debate the, the patient for that. But uh, as you mentioned in the literature, the same is not held true for acute arthroplasty for the acetabular fracture when you take all comers. Right. But is there a patient you could describe where you do think an acute arthroplasty um, would be a good option for them in terms of age, activity level, and fracture pattern? Yeah, so I think on the acetabular side of things, um, obviously, uh, you know, uh, the anterior sort of post, the, the anterior column posterior hemitransverse fracture pattern with impaction of the medial wall and um, the goal sign that Anglin discusses, I think, are, are bad actors. Um, so, you know, I would certainly, I don't know that it's a, Absolute indication, uh, Connor, but I think that it certainly warrants consideration. I think you also have to kind of look at the patient. You know, is this someone that you think has got, you know, bad teeth and, you know, homeless and maybe not the best candidate for an acute arthroplasty procedure? Um, you know, but if it's someone that you think is reliable, that sort of meet, passes the, you know, sort of general SNP test, if you will, um, you know, I think. It, in, in those fracture patterns where you don't think you're going to be able to, you know, bring the articular surface back down reliably and not have it, you know, fail, um, you know, I think that uh, plating the column, you know, plating the involved column and then putting in a total hip uh, is a reasonable thing to do. And so I don't think there's a clear absolute indication. I just think there's cases that you really should consider it more, um, you know, when you have that. Uh, impaction of the articular surface there in, in the medial wall sort of blow out. Nav and Adam, good job. In terms of the impaction, uh, we know that that's a problem. Yeah. Uh, it tends to be a big problem when it's cranial mm -hmm. or posterior. Uh, we know how to reduce it. I think the biggest problem is maintaining the reduction with either use of allograft or calcium phosphate or whatever you tend to use. Mm -hmm. 
I think a bigger problem uh, that we're seeing is patients who have uh, femoral head fractures, impaction of the femoral head, yeah. especially in the superior lateral location, and that's an area that we're doing some research on, looking at the failure rates in those patients. Yeah. The biggest challenge for me is that looking at the preoperative CT scan, assessing the patient, I still think that I can fix most of these, if not all. Mm -hmm. But when I get in there and I see something totally different, especially with the articular cartilage and delamination, then I'm like, oh, I wish I had the skill set to do a total hip now mm -hmm. in these patients. So it's really hard to tell, I think, yeah. preoperatively um, yeah. on a lot of these cases. And sure. I've done plenty of patients who've had impaction that uh, were older than 80 years old yeah. and now they're playing golf. So I think it's really hard to uh, determine what patient would do better with the total hip off the bat. Uh, my question to you guys would be, when you're seeing these patients in terms of our fixation, and it tends to be a pretty predictable fixation that we use, mm -hmm. what are some of the challenges for you with what we do um, that we could potentially change so you guys wouldn't have part of a time or you know, we don't have to come, we don't mind helping, but is there things we can do? Yeah put hardware in places where it doesn't get in your way, especially since most of these tend to be a posterior approach. Yeah. Are you talking about the acetabular side? Yeah. So, yeah. no, I would just say fix the fracture. Just do what you got to do. We can get around it. So, you know, I plan, you know, to bring metal cutting burrs. And we, yesterday we had a spring plate in the way. And we just we just cut it back so that it was no longer in our way. Um, it was nice having Connor there to help get some screws out, but I, I felt like that's something I could have, you know. Right done, but mm -hmm. uh, I certainly think um, uh, the most important thing that you guys are doing is fixing the fracture and giving the patient the best chance uh, to succeed. So okay. just put the screws where you got to put them. Okay. Yeah, so I, I have two kinds of comments on that. I would say that's true, but if you can get the same fixation and keep those screws away from the subchondral surface, I, I think it saves a lot of time uh, in detection. Potentially, when you go back to that case. Uh, the other thing I would say is I, I don't I don't know that it's the uh, I don't know that it's the worst thing in the world if if you get in there and see the lamination or something uh, that you know you didn't see preoperatively that makes you decide well maybe this person is you know going to need a, a hip replacement soon. Because again, technically, you can do a much better job if, for example, that posterior Columns column yeah. is fixed. And, and I think a perfect example of that, though I'm sure that was a very, very tough fracture to fix, uh, is, is the last case Adam showed, uh, where that posterior wall was gone. That's a young person, uh, and you, you know he ended up medializing that, raising the you know hip center of rotation. I think that has long-term consequences, uh, particularly in a young person. So, you know, ideally, obviously, you'd want to do one case for all of these people. Uh, but, but again, I'm, I'm not sure that's, that's, a, that's a fail. Yeah, and I mean, if you look at Dr. Bellabarba's paper, I mean, those patients that we, you end up converting do pretty well. So even if you get in there and there's, you know, damage to the femoral head or whatever, when we convert them, they tend to do all right compared to, you know, non-traumatic arthritis. Yeah, I mean, obviously it becomes a challenge for us from an orthoplastic perspective, but anyone who fixes any fracture doesn't assume that ultimately it'll fail and thinks three or four steps down the road. So I would echo everything that's been said. Yeah. Fix a fracture as best you can. Last quick comment. I think the one thing we struggle is not the anterior column pusher hemotransverse type geriatric mm -hmm. pattern because we can still keep that contained yeah. even if the joint incongruity is off. It's the blown apart posterior walls and the osteoporotic yeah. patient where we mm -hmm. It's hard to keep it contained, and that, right. those are two different issues. One is a contained hip with bad articular step off, and one is a, a unstable, sure. uh, you know, in, uh, with a, with a non-contained hip joint. Mm -hmm. maturity and character. It's hard to hire two young people at the same time uh, in the same specialty, and uh, that's something you're sort of often uh, commonly advised against, but it has worked really well in this case. Uh, and it's also, 
in great part due to the support they've had from Paul, who's here, uh, Paul Manor, and also from, from Seth. And so I want to thank you for the great talk. And I know a lot of people who have left and some of the people who are still here. Uh, I know this talk has little bearing. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at Suzanne right now. It has little bearing uh, to do with her pediatric practice. And uh, I saw some hand surgeons here also. Uh, but, I, but I really appreciate everybody coming in and uh, supporting uh, Grand Rounds in this class. Thank you. Thank you.